Welcome to The Debrief. We just finished filming Jonathan Bragdon for Capacity. He's helping make videos for uh, small business owners who are trying to figure out what type of uh, loans and debt and, and different types of money and funding they should get for their company. If you have not been to The Debrief before, first of all, welcome. We appreciate you being here so much. We have recently doubled our subscribership uh, over the past few mm-hmm. days with the Ryan Remote interview video. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching that. If you don't know what The Debrief is, it, this is kind of, we look at the filming day we just did and we kind of break down everything that happened what we need to improve on what went well what didn't and uh, we share everything we can with you we have no secrets is what we like to say uh and so Today we're going to co- talk about a couple of different things. Uh, for one, we built a brand new table and had to fake some reflections. Uh, we're going to talk about directing Jonathan and how that went. And we're also going to talk about a big bit focus crash that we had that really threw us off the rails. So the first thing we're going to start with is a brand new plate. And Jay is going to tell us how that influenced all our lighting and everything. Hello. Yes, I've been uh, looking forward to using this plate because we, it's been in the bank for a while. Like I think we've had it... Uh, we hadn't finished it. We went and filmed it, and it's been sitting there, and it was a really fun day. Um, I ate some of the best brisket of my life filming this one. So this is a place called Green Bean Coffee Company here in Chattanooga. What an awesome place to go to. Um, Jonathan is sitting at a table, obviously on a green screen. So what we did to blend him into this environment with lighting was if you'll, if you'll look at the right side of the screen, you obviously see big windows that are behind him. And then on the left side of the screen, we have a shadow side. So on the right side of him, we have our giant, what we call a gigalite, which is an eight by eight um, uh, scrim gym with two Intellitechs uh, behind it. And then on the other side of him, we have a really big bounce that has a light above him hitting the bounce for the fill. There you go. Andre's going to draw it for you guys. Um, Really, really, really liked the way that this set turned out. Um, we were we were in the middle of kind of lighting and figuring all this out, and Andre went to add, I think it was going to be an accent light for the table and his legs, but uh, the moment he turned it on, I actually freaked out and told him to stop because whatever he did with that little bit of light spilling into his face and on his body just absolutely sold it. Uh, it went from, yeah, that's good, it looks like he's there, to like, wow, that really that really does the trick. So we were really happy with uh, how that ended up. And we also have a hair light to his back left. Is that correct, Andre? Didn't we put it? Cause we, we do, were... but it's very, very minimal. You can just see it kind right. of right Yeah, there. and I and I believe I barn door. So we have it hitting his shoulder and some of the lower part of his body, but I barn doored it off of his head because we were getting a really gnarly reflection. So his head isn't actually getting as much of the uh, the light as much as it is just to figure out how to solve the outline problem right on his shoulder. So, um, but again, I was extremely happy with uh, with with how this ended up. Um, uh, yeah, keep and, going. And, yeah, and I would just say what we did uh, a little differently on this one is we do have a really massive, I think it's twelve feet by twelve foot uh, Westcott scrim gym over here that's that has two IntelliTechs behind him that's lighting him up like that. Yep. But uh, what Jay's talking about is there still wasn't enough punch. There wasn't enough like kind of hard light kind of hitting him a little bit. And so that's that's what we were doing is I actually was putting it in there for creating hard light on his face. But it was funny when we moved it. It was like, and there it is. Don't touch it anymore. We already did it. So <laughs> I think that's what was happening there, which is really great. So, yeah, I think that turned out really good. The other cool thing we did on this is we have a punch that we do. So this shot right here is actually the same as that previous shot you just saw. That's kind of a mid shot. This one right here. It's the same shot, but what we're doing is we're taking the green, we're running it into the ATEM, we are scaling that over a DVE. So we're taking this feed of the green, we're DVEing it full, uh, you know, zooming in a bit, and then we're taking that zoom output. So we're taking like an ME, we'll just say like ME4. We're on the ATEM constellation, and we're running that out and into a separate ultimate. And by doing that, we get two shots where he's looking at camera with his eyes. His eye line's perfectly the same. Obviously, we're losing a little resolution. Also, by doing that, I can take that background and we can blur it more. So you can see the difference of there and then this other shot where we just added a little more blur. We're running all of our plates through OBS, and that's how we're uh, rescaling them uh, easily. And later, I think we'll even talk about some blur that we're doing with them. 
And one thing I'll add before we move on is uh, we have really been figuring out the balance between soft and hard light. Like soft light is so pretty and it really fills in a nice space without being too harsh. But sometimes to sell that effect and to blend that foreground and the background together, that harsh light is needed. So it's, that's sort of a learning and growing process with us of like, where is that balance between uh, hard and soft light? Um, so we can move on to the next piece. We're going to look at the table that we use that day. Um, you're you're going to see it here again in a second. But the thing is, is the, the, the actual legs, the actual table that we owned that we were going to use before we kind of did a construction project had a veneer finish. So it wasn't actual wood. It was more like uh, MDF covered with a veneer finish to make it look like wood. And veneer is extremely reflective, which can cause a lot of problems. And I'll let Andre, I'll let you kind of explain this one a little bit. Okay, sure. So uh, yeah, we had a table, Isaac's demonstrating it for us on the screen here. <laughs> and so uh, we put the um, this table on, you can see on this side over here, how reflective it is of reflecting the green. And so by doing that, it's making it transparent. So we're never wanting things to be super reflective because they can reflect green. Uh, now there's ways we could get around that. We could adjust the matte density or the black gloss. Uh, both of these would help with that. But you can see right here, see that white area uh, that you see there? I guess I should color in something else. But right here on this side mm -hmm. and this side, we always want the, the matte to be fully black. So anytime it starts going gray like that, like see that area right there, we don't want that. So we were like, what are we going to do? It's 4 p.m. on the day before we're filming. Oh, no. Uh, what are we going to do? And uh, we're trying to figure out solutions because he's filming the next morning. And Cami comes up and she's like, I have a piece of wood if you don't care too much about it. And I think we can make a table. So, we'll, yeah, talk about that. Yeah. So I pulled this piece of wood out of a closet that we are currently storing our furniture in for set. Um, and we took it next door to Set in Stone, which is like a metal and woodworking shop. Um and asked Joel here to cut it out. So he's currently, you know, <laughs> outlining it. Um, so we cut it out and I ended up sanding it and staining it with two coats to get the desired color that we wanted. Um, and just kind of, I didn't put any finish on it to seal the stain because um, that would make it a little glossy and shiny. So we left it matte, no finish. Um, and I think it really helped, um, you know, the look and yeah totally and one thing that was really interesting from a management perspective i don't know if we have this shot but when joel was making it he's like hey do you want me to route off the edges there of is. the yeah and and i'm like i don't know like i've already asked him to do a lot because it's suddenly like will you please stop everything you're doing and make my dumb table and and i was very tempted i mean i literally said like nah it's okay it's fine and he's and he's like i mean i could do it and i'm like ah and in my manager mind i'm thinking I've already interrupted this guy's life to get him to make a table. It's really bad for me to like go f more, you know, and ask for more. And I don't know how long that's going to take and all of this. And it took, as you can see for me talking, he's done the whole table. <laughs> like it's like seconds to do this. And so a big management lesson for me is like, if I don't understand what's involved in doing something, don't assume that it takes forever because this little tiny bit of change that he did really smoothed off the table and made it look really really nice. Oh yeah. And I was tempted to just be like, nah, I'm, I'm, we're good. That's fine. And so, um, yeah, so, so be open. Uh, don't always assume everything's going to take forever and, uh, you know, ask more questions. I could have said, well, how long would that take? And then he could have just said a couple of seconds, but instead I just said, no, it's okay. And, uh, and so also being willing to be open to let the experts be expert in their thing. And it's like he knew that by doing that, that would be better. So there's a little management lesson. Uh, before uh, before we jump away, I just want to make sure that everybody knows that directly next door is a custom fabrication shop. <laughs> so like that place that you saw yeah, us in is, right. is next door, yeah. which is uh, a cheat code if you run a studio. Yep. So. And uh, one thing that happened, though, was we went to all the effort of building that table, and then we figured out a little <laughs> secret, uh, which is that it turns out the most important thing is that when you rotate your table, it reflects light differently, right? Yeah. So we figured out that, oh, man. So that's the new table that's top the new that table Kami top. has on top. She's just kind of rotating it to see. And it was like, oh, man. Actually, you can see, see how shiny it got. So it's like, oh, 
actually maybe if we just had rotated the table uh, so that the grain was maybe uh, perpendicular to the camera angle, that may have helped a lot. Yeah, so it, re it really depends on what type of tabletop that you have. Because if it's just a smooth surface, if it's reflective, true, can't really change it. But if it's like a wood texture or the veneer uh -huh. that had like a wood texture, that's going to kind of take in the light differently and like... If you move the tabletop so the grain is not where the light's coming from, it will reflect it differently. For oh, yeah. sure. Uh, yeah, Isaac, if you just pull that video back up, you could see uh, right here, where that's the new table that is now Isaac's wiping off, right? So it is much more matte, So which is great. And you can see in just a second, you're going to turn it. See how reflective it was right there and see through? So, and even here, when you walk away, if you'll just leave that on the screen, see how, ref see how much that's showing through right oh, yeah. there? So it still was massively more reflective than the new top. So the new top is superior. And what we found so far is being able to stain and only stain a matte, flat finish on top is ideal, right, for, for all these tabletops. I also think it just matches the set better. Sure. It just looks like it belongs in there a little more, so totally. that ended up working out well. One other funny thing we noticed when I was out there working on some things uh, earlier on was we noticed the Ultimate got weirdly blurry. Uh, where we were like, why does it look like this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. and so Ultimat has a ton of settings. There's a lot of different things you can do on the Ultimat. It's a very, very powerful tool. And uh, a lot of people get confused with that because it has so many options that it has in it. And I think we have a little video that'll show this. I don't know how well this translates, uh, seeing this here. Okay, oh great, uh, they've done more video than uh, <laughs> I've seen, way to go. Um, so inside Matt, uh, and then filters, there's this average that can show up uh, or median. Either way, you want these set at zero. So if there's, they intentionally blur <laughs> the shot, uh, I don't know why, uh, but it's terrible. I don't know how that got set. We did not change that setting and somehow that happened. And I was sitting there looking like, what in the world is going on with this shot? It looks terrible, it's super blurry. And for whatever reason, average had been set over to four. So just know that it doesn't matter if that says median or average, either way, it's just doing a blur. And you always want that, well, I don't know, obviously somebody wanted that set at something other than zero, but I can't think of a reason why I would want my shot to look blurry and out of focus. But if uh, yours does, when you hook it up to Ultimat, I would check those settings. Okay, so we mentioned the reflection on the table, uh, and that was like a keying problem, right? So that's green reflecting, seeing through, and it kind of like breaks, uh, breaks, oh, you know, makes it not look real at all because you can see through a table, which isn't real. Anyways, other reflections can help things. Uh, we c can help sell it and make it look even more real. So he had a mug on the table, and uh, you can see it here. And if you look into the mug, you'll start to see some reflections. And here is some film magic that we kind of like pushed into um, to make it more believable. Let, yeah, let's show that wide shot so we can establish what's in the room. Right. So the challenge is over here in the room is we've got all these plants over here. And what it was reflecting, you're seeing the finished product. But what it was actually reflecting before was just very, very obviously studio looking stuff was happening in the lighting of that. So then, okay, so Jay, take it away of what, what do we do to fix this up? Awesome, so you can see the plants uh, on the left here. So we wanted to add a sort of plant-like formality to it. And then you can see, uh, you don't really know what's on the right. Like, right, you see that's where the light is sort of motivated from. And you can obviously see those big windows. And we have our giant uh, light over there, our big soft light on the right side. So it did look like a window, sort of. It was just sort of a solid piece. So um, we kind of did some fun things to that. But before we get to that, I want to talk about the, the plants. And I'll let Cammie take over because she sort of, she she was the artist, uh, nice. if you will, on this one. Nice. Yeah. Um, so looking at the reflection, obviously, um, putting a plant up there, it didn't really help. Um, so I had to try and take some creative liberty into making fake plants. Um, so I took some black cinefoil <laughs> and some gaff tape That's and so kind of crumpled it up and taped it to the big uh, monolith that we have that bounces light onto the subject. Um, so I taped it on it there and it took a while to kind of get it in frame of where the mug is so it can look. Yeah, here I am like pointing and trying to figure out like a little to the left, a little to the right, get it into the right reflection. Um, and this might seem a little 
like a bit of a nuance kind of a thing. Um, but when you have something that kind of takes you, like if you, your brain registers and sees it, like that doesn't make any sense. And it kind of takes you out of yeah. the actual setting that you're in. So having those little details, we really like to make look awesome and kind of put you back into that world that we're setting up. Um, here Jay is um, on that side where the big window <laughs> is trying to make the little lines of the window. I'm trying to figure out where it's reflecting. Yes. On yeah. yeah, it's yeah. So That's why I look like a psychopath. Uh, <laughs> Just a that. little bit. He does um, that every day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what's funny about this one I was thinking about yesterday is uh, a lot of the times like clients will like point out like details. They're like, wow, you guys are so detail oriented. It's crazy. I just can't even see what you're doing. But this time was like, I actually looked at Jonathan's face <laughs> where we were like sticking <laughs> cinefoil to the, we are professionals. to the bounce. Yeah. And he was just like, I just don't get it. Like, he just kind of like didn't even ask questions. He like saw it. And like, I saw him like sort of gestures like to what are you guys doing? Nah, never mind. I just don't even. I can't even know. I joke, it was really funny. I so joked funny. that it was the most Hollywood thing we've ever done, though. Hundred percent. Because that's a hundred percent. You know, this is the type of stuff you have to do when you're on a film set. It's like, how do I fake reality? Oh yeah. I'm trying to make it look real. I don't. I can't make it look real. So how do we make it look real? So it was a funny moment of like, this is totally something that being some behind the scenes of some big budget movies that well we use tape and uh, we crumpled it up and you know. Yep. <laughs> I did want to mention one other lighting thing that we had, uh, and this is just a tip for anyone considering the hive lights. Mm -hmm. So some of the, uh, we're using maybe a slightly older generation. We love the output of them, but Jay, talk a little bit about what's happening right here. All right, well, it was obvious you saw that uh, <laughs> fall. So uh, basically, the, we, like he said, we love the color, we love the, the DMX. DMX control, uh, All we love a lot of things about it. Um, the hardware isn't amazing. Um, and I think that's just like wear and tear. Like I'm sure when you first buy it and you put it on, it's like rock solid. And there's a, there's this little spring with a clip that goes into like a little space that's supposed to lock it on. But after a while, those things start to wear out and they become extremely fragile. And in my opinion, honestly, extremely dangerous, especially when you're putting lights directly above people. Um, so what you, what you, which you won't see, but you can kind of use this for references. That light I was telling you guys about that kind of like made it work. Well, it was, well, actually, no, this light was for the bounce. Sorry, uh -huh. this is the light hitting the bounce. It was directly over Jonathan. And so I'm extremely paranoid because I'm like, dude, that stuff, I don't like that hardware. So it's, it's sitting directly over top of him. So uh, not only do we use gaff tape for art um, <laughs> and special effects, but we also, I, I taped that. I taped that reflector on there with like 30 pieces of tape, just double, just making sure that it wasn't going to fall off. And it had a safety chain too, I believe at some point. I went up there after I taped it and put it on there so that that didn't happen. I mean, I know I'm sitting there like kind of messing with it and jiggling it, but it, right. they, they have a mind of their own sometimes. Yeah. And the barn doors are even worse. Right. Yeah, so, so. Not, not a big fan of that. And then uh, let's talk about the frame guide that you guys came up with, because I think that's a cool addition to just do a simple overlay. I think maybe we even have uh, something that will show that. But we just created an overlay that's 9 by 16, and we did that so that if he ever wants to use any of this on social, like uh, doing uh, a vertical Sorry, uh, yeah, vertical post. Here's here's what that looks like. And so, <laughs> Cami's pumped uh, being on camera Ooh. right there. But uh, that's just a simple. We just assign that to an upstream key, able to just put that in, and in that way we can see have we framed up our wide shot in a way that lets um, them crop in on that center crop and still be able to have a nice uh, shot for that. So I thought that was an awesome addition. So way to go, guys, on that. So something that we have struggled in the past with, but we thought we had fixed, is Mori. So Mori is back uh, just a little bit. And Andre, would you like to explain yeah. this? Well, yeah. I mean, the thing is on, and I think we have a shot that may kind of show this as we're kind of pointing to it, but it may be hard to see. So here's the deal. Uh, More it really shows up a lot on these 6K cameras, um, more than we expected, more than we expected. And so uh, one of the things we've recently done is we've gone to raw light and we've purchased the OLPF sensors and we've put those on top or filters on top of the camera. And uh, it's a fairly intensive thing. You got to take apart parts of the camera to take the filter that's there and put it on and it has solved like 90 something percent it's not 100 obviously um, <laughs> a really high percentage like this is the first time we've seen it and i can't remember how many months we've had it 
uh, with that on. But this particular sweater was exhibiting that. And the reason I'm making a point to really point that out is something you should know is if your camera does exhibit any amount of more, if you use the Ultimat, it will uh, really accentuate that. Mm -hmm. So just know more a maybe 10% on your camera, it's going to be 40 to 60% on the Ultimat. So Ultimat really seems to want to show off more. Maybe we should have that blur back in and then maybe that fixes it. But anyway, just be aware of that, that that happens. And uh, OLPF is definitely the way to go uh, to solve most of this. Now uh, on the OLPF is, are there some, are there some trade-offs with that, Andre? I don't want to talk about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, man. there are some trade-offs. And so one of the things that's happened using that raw light is I have a tiny little outline that's driving me bananas. So I before that, I was able to get a perfect key around the edges. And now I have like one pixel uh, that's kind of bright. Uh, and you can do this horizontal and vertical shift on uh, the input inside the Ultimat under settings. So there is a foreground input UV position that you can turn and you can kind of wiggle around that back and forth to the left and the right. And what I really wish I could do is just shrink it by about two pixels. But anyway, just be aware that the raw light could introduce some outlining artifacts yep. uh, on your image. Yeah, and that goes in, uh, that goes back to lighting too. Like that kind of like, you know, kind of cycles back to that because like that's a, that's our main way of combating that, that outline is to hit that hard light on the edge of their shoulder or their arm or whatever um, to kind of, to kind of make that go away. Does that, a question I have, and I think I, I think I know the answer, but does it does that outline um, happen more with like specific colors? I don't think so, Jay. I think it's um, so far I've seen it happen across the board. Uh, certainly, if they're wearing a light shirt and it's a white outline that's happening, then obviously that's less noticeable than a dark clothing. But it's right. happening across all of it now, and it makes me very sad. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's hilarious. Um, I mean, it, for the most part, getting rid of the more a, I mean, literally it was painful to yeah. like have people come in and try out four shirts and three of them and three uh, that are normal shirts, like just a solid color shirts. Like that has more a too. I, everything has more a for some reason. Yeah. It could be like any kind of pattern or any kind of fabric. It was, it was beginning to get ridiculous, Yeah, yeah. but I'll take a little bit of an, outline. I know it, it's, it's worth it. It's a trade off. <laughs> um, well, let's dive into some of the directing stuff. Uh, Jonathan came in a uh, super smart, um, extremely driven guy. Um, but not everybody really translates that across camera. We were talking about some difficulties with um, directing with him um, that can happen with anybody. We were just feeling them and we're talking about them now specifically because this is the debrief from him. But um, it was really hard to get him to come across uh, passionate on camera. And that is something that we deal with is like, man, when you're trying to sell some people on a course, um, or anything that is kind of like, it seems like a course, but in reality, it's like a pitch deck to get them to work with you. You want small business owners to really feel the passion um, oozing out of you as you're explaining what you're going to do and how you're going to help them. And that was something that I struggled with big time on getting him to kind of force that across the screen. He was really good with using his hands, um, but there was a, there were a few factors into into why I, I we we struggled getting like the best we could out of them. Does anybody, I, I directed and I, I did 20, I tried to talk to him 20 different ways, <laughs> You did. but does anybody have, can anybody critique me? <laughs> well, I think I, it's look, it's super hard when we realize we're on camera, suddenly we become very aware of, mm -hmm. well, what do I do with my hands? Why are they going up in the air? Right. Suddenly people who are not used to being on camera suddenly have a very, like, I don't know how to act. And we have this internal image. All of us do of what we're like. Uh, and we, we are not very cognizant of that at a, at a high level, but when it comes to being on camera, we suddenly feel like, man, I am, this way I should stand and sit and posture and all of these things in a certain way that is what I believe internally I am and how I function. And so I think he was going through that uh, mm -hmm. for sure of just kind of a like, how do I, how do I be on camera? Yeah. And, uh, and so you really work through that. It's so 
frustrating though because <laughs> when the person like and cut and then they're like hey cool i'm totally fine and action i'm now stiff and it's yeah. like oh this is hard this yeah. is hard to figure out how to navigate that uh it's very common it's not uncommon but it's obviously common around people that are high knowledge experts but maybe haven't spent a lot of time in front of the camera well, yeah this, this also happens it's like i'm a theater kid just gonna put it out there this is basically stage fright or like a performance anxiety um when you are kind of being yourself but then you get in front of a camera and it's like everybody's gonna see this and you get in your head and you kind of psych yourself out at yeah. the beginning but then once you you have to get over that mental hump to then like get into it and get in a flow state as jay likes to call it and just kind of get into the content which is something that's really hard to get over especially if you've never done something like this before yeah yeah i really want to break into the psychology of all of that because i'm extremely interested but one thing i was thinking about was like i was thinking about that cami it's like it, it's uh it's being in front of a camera but for me really it's also like the it's like this build up of like this thing you're building too and now it's finally time to do it because like the and i think i think it's like seeing the red light and it pressing record and being like crap now i have to perform because the day before he was in here we love to have people come in and this is a this is a secret tip if you can get people in the day before yeah. and you can light them the day before that makes your morning the next morning a <laughs> lot easier a lot less stressful yes um but i, I noticed something because it wasn't the camera itself or maybe it was it was more professional but i want to i want to understand the psychology of somebody who gets in front of a camera and they completely shut down versus somebody like him who was absolutely incredible on zoom so when he had when it was a conversational piece and he was talking and explaining and expanding on what he was talking about it was like a completely different person he he really delivered the content and everything he was trying to explain to his clients very well and so we always tell people, imagine another person on the side of that camera. And I act weirdly enough, feel like I'm sort of doing that right now because I'm looking at it. But we always <laughs> tell people that. And like in my mind, that doesn't always click as like the thing that like helps the person. But like now as thinking through it more and understanding like, oh, wait, actually, when he was talking to people, you know, he was he was killing it. Um, and doing a really good job. Yeah. And that was the, that was what we, I mean, Andre, you had me press record the day before when he was in there on a zoom call. Cause it was so good. Right. Cause it was like, Oh, well that's what we want right there. Yeah. And I think here's the challenge when a client comes in and they feel the need to start self editing. So yes. they are talking, uh, hold on, let me say it again. They're talking, Oh, hold on. <clears throat> You, you know, when a client is talking, right, when they start doing that, they're like breaking that momentum, like Cami was mentioning that Jay mentioned the flow, right? So they're breaking that flow. And instead, they're creating this new state of like, talk for a little bit and then stop, talk for a little bit and stop. And it doesn't get it in momentum and interesting. Instead, it just feels uh, you know, it just doesn't feel good, I guess is the easiest way to say it. Yeah, well, you get different levels of energy. And, and there's, there's all kinds of differences and variables that come from it but also what it what it does in my mind is it cripples the person from getting into that flow state so it cripples them in a way where they're they can't think forward so the flow state idea to me is once you get the ball rolling then your brain works better about knowing what's coming up next how to end what you're talking about now and move on to the next subject and when you're stopping and starting and stopping and starting like a lot of people do when they self-edit and they come in here and they try to make it perfect every single time yeah. it really it, it prevents that so my goal is to get them in there and make them feel as comfortable as possible and and basically let them know that like hey stumbling is okay let's push through this it's more personal and you're kind of like getting the ball rolling we'll do multiple takes but man if it if if they can't if they can't grasp that then it uh then it becomes to to be challenging i have mentioned on this podcast before um tyler calls it the talk and it's where like I introduce myself two different ways where if i was on camera if i wasn't on camera and that's worked on so many people um a lot of people, everybody always understands it, but this was the first time where I had to do it twice and it, yeah. and I, and I still wasn't, still wasn't able to get it to work. Also, we should also mention that is, was this his first time ever on camera filming something well, like this? I, it seemed like it was, he was new to this th sort of thing. Maybe he's been on camera before. I think yeah. the bigger thing was it was a different genre of content to what he's normally doing. Yeah. So that zoom call, that's very conversational and everything 
it when he started at near the end of the day, he started to have content that was more like what was in those Zoom calls. Right. And he was doing a lot better. That's right. right. So what I feel like is part of the issue sometimes is we need to, I think, work with clients and go, hey, you're doing this series of things. What are you most comfortable talking about? And let's start there. Yeah. Let's start with the videos that you feel like if I asked you about them right now, you could tell me the whole script back yeah. of your hand. Yeah. You know, let's yeah. start there and build up to, hey, I'm doing my intro because he's never made an intro before. He actually had a great opener, which he opens this thing with. If you're here, you're looking for a check, right? And he opened it with that. I'm like, that's great. Like, that's a great line. Like, I love where you're going with it. So he had an idea. It wasn't like he was coming in here and like, well, I'm, I've got all of these courses and then I got to intro it. And so I guess I'll just, I don't know. So the intro's good. It's me, you know, like he, yeah. he had an idea of where he was going and it was similar to what he would do day to day. The problem was just integrating it together in a way. And I think what can get frustrating is doing something again and again. This is the second time we've recorded this debrief <laughs> and uh, doing something again <laughs> yeah. and again sure. can get repetitive and bad <laughs> and it's it can be frustrating. Yeah. Right. Uh, but I think that's how you can get an amazing performance yeah. out of someone, Definitely. especially if they're not used to being on camera. So what I felt with that intro, some it's like sometimes if you can get them to do more performances of other things. That helps improve them potentially. Yeah. I don't know. That's something that I've been thinking about that we can yeah, maybe... get them in momentum. An object right. in motion stays in motion. An object rest stays at rest. And yep. the most energy is getting it in motion. So getting that in motion, that's a great idea. And I also mm -hmm. like personal over per, uh, perfect. As you were kind of talking about that. It's like, oh, we need you to be more personal of who you are as a person yeah. versus being perfect of saying every word exactly the same. Because yep. what we want is who you authentically are, not who you're trying to pretend to act like you are. So yeah. That was great. Great. You know, uh, real quick on the on the editing side of things, which we won't talk too much on, uh, Morgan is TDing. But uh, Morgan has gone through and sort of like um, taken these and kind of chopped them and, and put them together. And Morgan does a really good job of cutting out some of the dead space and some of the like quirkiness of it. But what's funny is, is I actually went back on like a couple of those and I actually pulled it back and let that space happen because he flowed into the next segment and it felt like he, and instead of feeling like a robot onto the next subject, it felt like I had an actual human on the screen talking to me. So that was a, that was a really important, important point to me. Love that. Yeah. And so while we were doing all of this, we're going through the day, then we had some problems. Wah, wah. So uh, yeah, so bad things happen. We're big users of BitFocus here. Uh, we have a million stream decks. Here's one of them uh, that I can kind of show. We have a million of them, and uh, we use them to control a bunch of things. But they're the most important for Jay in the director's chair because he has the ability to start and stop recordings. And when you start a recording, it makes a document in Notion that then you hit a button and it makes a timestamp. It shows you how long since the video started to when you make that note. And that way we know, hey, we need to cut here. We're going to pick up here, stuff like that. Then we also have a timer that triggers on our pro presenter stage display that shows how long the video has been recording. That's mostly so the client can see, oh, I had a six minute long video that I've been recording. That's how I'm doing. Both of those things failed. And uh, we think that is partially because Pro Presenter, we had tried something and made a separate stage display that screwed up the other thing. Time Stamper with Notion, we're not quite sure what happened there. And I'm a little worried it might break in the future. But the bigger problem that happened is once that broke, Jay <laughs> couldn't do his job. I broke. And that, yeah, how did that, what happened for you there in that moment? Oh, so basically, like all the controls that I typically go off of or, or I typically use uh, were like completely taken away from me, um, which is typically okay if that happens and the pro presenter clock starts. I'm good. I can go into Notion and I can just manually enter the time. I don't care. Like it's it's just a, a little extra typing. It's it's no biggie. But the timer also didn't start. So uh, I was he was like doing things that I definitely needed to notate. Mid-take. Mid it had yeah. been like three to four minutes. Yes. We don't know how long it had been. We're suddenly real. You're yeah. suddenly realizing, who knows how long this video is Yeah, because I'm trying to click a button, and, and for those of you who know Stream Decks and BitFocus, there's a, there's a red square that hits in the top corner, and whenever I see that, I start to freak out because I can't click the button. So my I had an idea of what to do to fix this, um, which would be I have a multi-view here in front of me, and I have uh, eight hyperdecks. So on, and they're all set to 
sync off time code of time of day, correct? So, um, which, which, by the way, we did that because we had had some issues right. with uh, multicam clips not lining up together, yep. and we had to manually push them back and sync them. It's like, oh, this would fix it. Right. There may be a different way to do it. I need to look into it now, but that's how they're currently set up. But it that's works. Why. And it works. Um, but you can adjust the uh, time code settings on the HyperDeck. So you can do time of day or you can do length of video. And so my idea was... Let's change it to link the video on one of them. Uh, not all of them, but that the one that's green here at the bottom that we don't really use. I was like, if I just change that to um, length of time, then I'll link the video, then I'll be able to write them down. And I went, no, Jay, that will, that will break so many things. No, like I just shut you down, basically. Like you're still thinking. You haven't even like fully considered the idea, and I uh-huh. shut you down here in this moment because I'm going, well, wait a minute. It doesn't matter if you do that right now because yeah. he's in the middle of a take that we can't recover the time from. There's just no way we could have done it in that moment. Yeah, and all the- that's happening in my head is uh, Isaac's name with a bunch of expletives swirling <laughs> in a big pot. <laughs> because I'm now shutting you down instead of going, hey, Jay, wait, wait, wait. What are we going to do to fix it for this one? Because yeah. changing it wasn't going to fix it for this one, so we would have to wait anyways. What can we do to fix it right now? The answer ended up being, well, good news, it's Morgan's problem. <laughs> Basically, yeah. And so and the, my freak out is because, like I've said before, like, it's I'm I'm worried about being able to do my job, not for me, but for the person that's editing. Because I've been there before, and I've gotten crappy notes, and I've been and I've had that headache. So my worry was all about Morgan um, mm-hmm. being able to edit correctly. And you and I were in a tussle. I was yep. headed over there because you were like, "Nah," and I was like, "Well, you don't tell me what to do, so I'm gonna go press a button." And then Morgan's like, "Hold up, dude! Like, l- let's hold on." And then finally, Morgan was like. Dude, I'll just watch it. It's it's no big deal. Like I'll 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 edit it, watch it, and figure it out. And that was what settled it. That's what settled it all. But the best part of all of this is Andre probably has a completely different perspective. On what we're <laughs> yeah, yeah. About. Uh, I don't know if you can show the uh, behind the scene. You know the the yeah. There you go. So here here's where we all sit. Hey. And uh, Emma's creeping on us, uh, helping us stay on task. And Morgan's up there TDing. So uh, Morgan was here next to me where Emma is, and so I can kind of. See over, you know, I've got this new OLED. It's really beautiful, um, but I could see over, and I, it from my perspective, it was like we're trucking along, everything's awesome, and nuclear explosion is happening, <laughs> and I'm like, oh no. And so, you know, I think we've we've kind of narrowed down on our company these three values that we're trying to do, which is be excellent, love people, and adapt and innovate. And in that moment, when Jay is like. I have a 10 out of 10 problem that's a complete blocker for me doing my job. And mentioning that to Isaac, Isaac's no shutdown response left no room for any other answer except it's broken. Good luck. You know, like too bad. And so and so then Jay's left with, well, I can either accept the reality that you've just presented to me of there's no option whatsoever, or I'm just going to take matters into my own hands. And so that's what you were doing. It's like, well... You've told me no, but there has to be a way. And so, you know, I think the the tip there is kind of what you guys have already unpacked. But, you know, Isaac, in the future, it's going to be better for you instead of being like, no, it's more like, hey, OK, hang on that. I don't know how to do that right now for this. I understand that's a big problem. Let's think through some ideas of what we can do. My mind's not immediately coming up with an answer. Right. That's still OK, because it understands that, oh, we're still on the same team. We're still trying to work together to solve it versus like, nope. Uh, like the Jimmy Fallon uh, tech guy, computer guy, you know, move, you know, (laughs) instead of that, it was like, so that, that could have been an easier way to solve that. Like you've mentioned of just acknowledging like, Hey, okay. All right. This is a real problem. Let's figure out the answer. And then Jay on your end, you know, uh, you, that shut you down as it it makes sense that it would have. And then that was making you like, well, I'm going to just go over there and push buttons then until I can figure out an answer. Like I'm going, I'm determined to find an answer. And, um, you know, and so that was also caustic too, because it was making it where it was like, oh no, you know, cause yep. Morgan and Isaac are now understanding like doing that is going to also cause other problems. So it was, it was making everything go way up, way up. And so I think we just, we have to be careful about our responses. It's easy in the heat of the moment to just be like, no, you know, wrong. <laughs> Max, my six-year-old, he started to say incorrect. It's so like so you'll funny. say something and you're like, blah, 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 blah. He's like, incorrect. You know, 
and it's 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 <laughs> hilarious right now because he's six saying incorrect but there's a point where it's like you're gonna get punched if you say that uh <laughs> to some people right because it just leaves no room for any other interpretation or any other thing to happen and so similarly uh we've just got to realize like um you know i think i think the the way to approach that is like okay i hear you saying no but let's figure out an answer you know right now if isaac says well there isn't one then that's going to be 10 out of 10 annoying right so it, it takes both sides to start diffusing yeah, totally. to understand we're all on the same page we all want the same thing we want to solve this for the client we want to be the best we could be uh and since then we've thought through like 10 ideas of how mm -hmm. we could have solved that right yeah. well and the thing that i think is frustrating is in that moment for that video there were two options either we didn't have time code or we stop them those are the only things I can think of that would have fixed it for that specific video. Yeah. Because at that point, I can't think of anything that would have had a timer related enough for us to figure it out without rewatching the video. That was that was I mean, and so what's well, funny we is we could have taken we could have taken notes starting from when he whatever he said, like we could be right, listening but, to it. And yeah, like, like at this word this capital yeah. thing, that's where there was an issue. There, there were no amazing though, like there was no there was no timer in right. any way at all. So it's like the only other solutions were all medium level. It wasn't like there was like the thing but i agree like there could have been things to happen there but i realized the biggest thing is like we needed to know it's like okay well i can't retroactively fix it we need to figure out we're gonna have to take a pause on the next thing before we get to the next video for yeah. sure and what i needed to do in that moment with you is like okay this really sucks how about before the next video i take some time to figure it out right now what can i do to help you instead yeah. of being but what i did instead is i laser focused on well i've got to fix this so that by the time you're recording the next video it's ready yeah which is what i was thinking and couldn't communicate because i was totally. also before this i had been editing b-roll and doing so, so i was so like mode Different shifting modes. yeah and it was just weird yeah um the last thing i will say like we were talking about flow state the thing is is too is like finally after nine takes of the first one he finally had a good take on the second <laughs> one and that's when this that's happened. when this happened <laughs> that was the most frustrating part of it all because it's like oh i don't i don't want to uh, hey one thing i'm super proud of us though is that even in the midst of because we're not always like we love each other but that doesn't mean we always love each other and so in even in the midst of that us being able to have this conversation is so healthy it's so good for us to be able to unpack this it's great look we're not going to always be perfect but if we have an attitude of reconciliation if we have a way of trying to think through okay here's how we're gonna do it better we become unstoppable so that's way to go guys on all of that and yeah. so listen hey thanks for watching this debrief we, there's a lot of different things that happened i was super proud of the way this set ended up looking uh, and, and I think we really got Jonathan in a great place. Like, I think we ended up with some really great content for him. And a cool thing has happened to us. We released this video teaching how Ryan and uh, I looked like we were in the same room and we're, and he's in Australia and I'm in our studio here. And that really blew up for us. That's a big blow up. You know, like a lot of views happened and a lot of new subscribers. So if you're one of those people that made it all the way to this point, way to go. Thanks for watching this. Our goal here is to just tell you every single thing we can think of to help. You know, this is the show I want as a studio owner. Like, I want to watch, like, how are they handling these different things? What are they thinking through? And so hopefully you found some gold uh, in this episode. Uh, I think there's gold in every single one of them, actually. So thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed and you got all the way to this point, please subscribe. And we'd love to just keep you uh, come with us on this journey. We want you to sh see everything that we're showing and doing and uh, we, we have a lot in store in the future that we can't wait to share with you so thank you for watching